Welcome to the LSU NCBRT Preparedness Podcast. I'm your host, Ashley Markle. I'm a curriculum development specialist here at NCBRT, and I work in collaboration with subject matter experts to create valuable and timely training for the responder community. The National Center for Biomedical Research and Training provides mobile training to both the national and international emergency response community. Today on the podcast, we're talking to Robert Holden and Steve Golubic about the challenges that tribal communities face in supporting emergency management and how they face these challenges. So can you talk a little bit about the importance of including tribal communities in conversations surrounding emergency management? Let's start with the basic fact that Native people live and work in tribal communities as well as non-Native communities. And uh, they could contribute to the local economies as well as tribal economies and purchase goods, services from non-Native businesses. And we also pay federal, state, and local taxes. Tribal governments in many areas of the country are the largest employers, which includes local non-tribal citizens. Most of these non-tribal employees don't live on tribal lands, which means they don't spend their better than average tribal generated paychecks within tribal borders, uh, but spend in their non-tribal communities, which benefits uh, the uh, those local communities, uh, whether it's taxes uh, from purchases, real estate, and their own incomes, you know, from the income tax base. If it weren't for tribal communities in some areas, the, the local city and county governments wouldn't be the beneficiaries of, of all of these uh, taxes. However, in, in any tax scheme, if a portion of the taxes go to public safety, it would seem logical that the local governments have some sense of wanting to protect the citizens wherever they're working uh, because it indirectly benefits them. Uh, and so those taxes go to emergency management responsibilities. So uh, that seems like that they should be supportive of um, uh, tribes and, and tribal emergency management uh, needs to ramp up their uh, infrastructure regarding emergency management. But that doesn't always happen, however. Uh, in some areas, tribes may not be just the first responders, but they will be the only responders. Uh, some locations, tribes have the best equipped and trained response organizations and personnel in the area, but they also have no qualms about responding to whomever needs assistance, whatever that might be. They're just doing their jobs. It's also a fact that there's a significant amount of critical infrastructure on, near tri on and near tribal lands. There's utility power grids, which traverse through tribal lands, relay towers for communications, which are vitally important and, you know, for everyday use in addition to emergency situations. Uh, railroads, highways, crisscross tribal lands for normal commerce. Uh, a disruption of any of these or a combination from, the, you know, from the hands of terrorists or natural events, whether it's tornadoes, floods, blizzards, would no doubt hamper lifestyles and create havoc, not just locally, but have far-reaching and perhaps long-lasting effects. So why wouldn't anyone want to support funding and technical assistance for tribes uh, to develop enhanced emergency response capabilities of neighboring jurisdictions? Uh, it would prevent catastrophic service, uh, situations that could happen at any given moment. Another important uh, factor is that tribal citizens have dual citizenship citizenship of the respective tribes and the United States. Uh, the status of either of these uh, characteristics entitles tribal citizens to all the rights, responsibilities, and protections of tribal governments, as well as from local, county, and state governments. Before 2013, tribal governments had no option uh, to seek an emergency or major disaster declaration under the Stafford Disaster Relief and Emergency Assistance Act except to make a request to a state governor for a state declaration. There are instances where, because the impacts were only on tribal lands, state officials were reluctant uh, to pursue a presidential declaration because the cost share would be borne by that state. So there are several instances of that. Uh, but the Santa Recovery Improvement Act amended, that amended the Stafford Act provided authority for tribes to make a direct request for a disaster declaration to the president. The option to manage disaster is a recognition of tribal sovereignty and maintains decision-making authority in the best interests of the tribes. The Stafford Act Declaration Authority also could benefit non-natives who live on Indian tribal lands to have a tribe manage the declaration 
because, as was said, there may be non-tribal impacts, impacts to non-tribal uh, residents living on and near the reservation where that damages threshold that's required under the Stafford Act may not reach that point where a governor would want to make a request. So if a tribe does that, it would certainly benefit everyone in those areas. One of the first lessons I learned as a new emergency manager was that disasters have no boundaries. They go where they go. They do what they do. They really don't care because they're not concerned about a line on a map. Another lesson was that the worst time to meet somebody, whether it be another responder or law enforcement officer, your uh, emergency management counterpart from another county or another tribe, is when the disaster is happening and they show up at your office and they introduce themselves. We need to work together. We need to figure out ways that we can come together prior to an incident happening. Because they said that incidents don't care where they are, it's imperative that units of governments introduce themselves and cooperate prior to that next incident. Tribes are part of your communities. <clears throat> they have the same roles and responsibility as any government to protect lives and property, as Robert just mentioned. It's the, it makes sense that when planning and preparing for an incident, all surrounding governments are included in that process. If you plan together, train together, and learn together, doesn't it make sense that you will be able to respond better together to protect lives and property? After all, not everybody has the same unlimited resources or unlimited sources of funding, nor the capabilities to manage a major incident on their own. We have to work together. The question I always ask is this, why wouldn't you want to use the resources and assets I have, if I'm your neighbor and you don't have the things needed to ma manage your incident, someone must make that first move, cross that invisible line that we call a border of jurisdiction and make it the offer. Politics and history aside, we have to forget some of those things and come together to work together. If FEMA's whole of community concept is going to work, tribes need to be included in the process from the beginning, not at the end. Once that happens, Communities can fill the gaps in all of their programs and their program efforts and the people will be much better served. What is the impact on tribes of the government moving to more virtual operations in terms of applications for funding? That's sort of a broad based question. And I'd like to take a little bit of a different path and uh, talk about circumstances beyond virtual operation and funding applications. Uh, which can create uh, problems, but there's also uh, virtual react access reality uh, regarding connectivity and interoperability in Indian country. Roughly nine out of 10 adults in America use the internet and it's considered a necessity of modern life. Uh, Native American communities should have the same access to these opportunities of the digital age as any other American. Yet internet access in Indian country remains stubbornly and persistently low. In 2020, the FCC estimated, the Federal Communications Commission estimated that only 47% of homes on tribal lands have access to broadband networks. Uh, one member of Congress has stated that even the Government Accountability Office, which is the top federal government watchdog, reports that the FCC statistics contain errors, may overstate the presence of high-speed service on tribal lands. There's other studies that have been done one study showed that 18% of reservation residents have no internet access, whether it's land-based or wireless. 33% of reservation residents rely on cell phone service for at-home internet. 49% rely on land-based internet service provider, which is whether it's cable, DSL, or dial-up at home. And 31% have spotty or no internet connection at home via a smartphone. Um, given the benefit of these statistics, um, let's say that broadband access was 50% if the world, if, and if that was the world you lived in. Let's say your child had an assignment in a remote distance classroom and the instructor only received 50% of what your child's work was and uh, turned it in, and that would probably be incomplete, right? If you have a task while working at home and your boss got only half of the work that you produced, that might not be acceptable. You might get dinged for perhaps poor performance. 
If you're involved in an accident and the dispatcher only heard half of your location, that might not work out so well for you. Uh, if your home is on fire or you're a police officer encountering shots fired and the dispatcher can't decipher or obtain the critical information need and only heard half of that transmission, that might not work out so well either. I guess the bottom line is that if you live on tribal lands, you're automatically at 50% greater risk from harm not living on tribal lands. But those are the daily impacts from having to rely on virtual operations. Without adequate access to broadband and wireless networks, regular governance activities, as well as essential services, uh, including fill out federal forms for grant applications, but things such as public safety, an emergency manager create a dangerous void to all members of the public who should be protected. Before I talk about training and, and grant writing, I'd like to share a short story with you that follows Robert's comments regarding the internet. It goes like this. Charles M. Russell, the president of Diné College, an institution with campuses and sites in Arizona and New Mexico and Utah that also serves the Navajo Nation, recalls, and I quote, To give you an idea, when the pandemic first hit, we surveyed our students asking, do you have access to the internet? Yes or no, and explain. One student explained that he has to drive 15 miles to go to a mesa, then climb on a hill that's a little higher in order to get cell service. And he answered yes. Who else would answer yes? Unquote. The assumption here is that everyone has the same equal access to the internet and can easily navigate systems, whether it's for a federal grant application or to Google something to find out how to cook something uh, with the newest and greatest recipe or anything else that you might want to find. This Navajo example is only one of the countless examples of why it isn't the same for anyone and why things are a little bit different in Indian country when it comes to internet access. Some of the other issues that we have are lack of training in grant writing. If you listened to our earlier podcast, you may recall that we touched on this issue. For many years, tribes have been asking for assistance to obtain meaningful training that is relevant to their needs, not necessarily if it fits uh, with the state or federal government. When we talk to tribal members, their reaction is clear. They all concur that the response they receive from FEMA and other federal agencies is for them to access the internet courses or call their tribal liaisons for assistance. That doesn't work. It's unacceptable when tribes don't have access to the internet or their regional tribal liaison is a part-time employee who does not give priority to tribal issues. Without the prior knowledge that a lot of other people have, or the experience in accessing the federal system, tribes are at a major disadvantage. Tribes always find the federal computerized application processes complicated and cumbersome. Poor internet connections cause tribes to lose their applications or they're even prevented from accessing the electronic application in the first place. Requests for help tend to go unanswered and tribes then generally just give up. They quit. They don't even bother to fill out the applications for very very desperately needed funding in a lot of cases. Those of our listeners who have navigated the computerized grant application process know there are certain words and phrases the federal government uses to complete applications online. Learning those systems and phrases is usually part of a grant writing class offered by the federal government. Most tribe grant writers are not aware of these training classes, nor have they taken them. The attitude of the federal government seems to be that everyone knows computers, has access to the internet, and can complete the applications without any problems. It isn't as easy as that, and the one-size-fits-all concept doesn't work, especially in Indian country. Tribes don't have that base knowledge and haven't had the unlimited opportunities to gain valuable experience in the same manner as large metropolitan areas and people that work in those areas. What goes on in New York City, as an example, is not necessarily what goes on in Indian country. Uh, So how do you think local, state, and federal governments can better support the tribes? Earlier in this discussion, we talked about recognizing tribes as governments. I also talked about including tribes in planning, training, exercises, and grants with surrounding units of government. 
breaking down the barriers and crossing the street to work with tribes isn't really a difficult thing when you think about it. Tribes want to be included in all of the disaster or emergency management community activities. Tribes want to be treated as equals and to be recognized as contributors to the planning efforts. What they don't want is to be seen as afterthoughts. In reality, tribes don't take funding away from states or local governments either, in spite of the common way of thinking. Instead, with their inclusion, they're an additional asset that can be used when that next incident crosses those imaginary lines on a map and enter your area. The simple solution seems like um, the commercial phrase, just do it. Uh, as Steve said, doesn't take that much sometimes to reach out, communicate, work together, uh, establish a mutual aid task force uh, or work group and figure out who has what capability and work out a, a memorandum of understanding, a memorandum of agreement and take that path. Uh, that's good for all. There are many emergency management cooperative relationships across the country between tribes and, and local governments and state governments. And the local residents of the nation are better off for these interactions. Uh, there's a reality, though, that the majority of the tribes are in situations where there's a lack of cooperation with local and state governments. It hasn't been that long since some states had laws on the books pro pro that prohibited allocation of funding and other resources to tribal governments. Some local officials still harbor that attitude, unfortunately. There's a lot of undercurrent and sometimes highly visible presence of political and legal issues between tribes and local and state jurisdictions. Longstanding treaty rights and sovereignty disputes exist over gaming, taxation, casino revenue sharing, water rights, environmental quality regulatory authority, and hunting and fishing regulations and enforcement. Uh, in short, whoever comes with this, this answer um, to that equation may well win a Nobel Prize, I think. Uh, but progress has been made, and we believe that efforts such, such as we're doing here, you know, educating uh, those who may not understand tribal governments in history, and as well as their status. Uh, but they're willing to work out the differences, see the commonalities, and take a path forward for the greater good. There are even some areas where potentially good projects are developing in regard to federal government support, uh, but these programs sometimes require better support and direction from, from the federal government. Uh, there's a federal community energy, excuse me, there is a federal emergency communications initiative that has achieved some of its congressionally mandated objectives, but there's much left to do in the regards to trust responsibility. On its website, FirstNet states that the FirstNet mission is to deploy, operate, maintain, and improve the first high-speed nationwide wireless broadband network dedicated to public safety. This reliable, highly secure, interoperable, and innovative public safety communications platform will bring 21st century tools to public safety agencies and first responders, allowing them to get more information quickly and helping them to make faster and better decisions. Uh, it's a good concept, perhaps some benefit, uh, but there's a lot to be left to be done in this area, as I said. Some tribes are waiting for action by FirstNet to construct communications towers, uh, consult with them on the infrastructure that's required, uh, siding towers, uh, what are, many things that uh, will benefit uh, the first responder network and for the uh, good of all people in those areas. Uh, there's a five-year deadline, um, basically a report card coming up in a couple of years. And it's going to be interesting to see how much can be done uh, during that time. I guess probably the uh, stickler in all of this for tribes is that it's not money this time because AT&T has the contract to do this first net operation. They've received $7 billion from the federal government, and that allows them an, over an $81 budget annually uh, to do the things that need to be done. So there's a lot of le work left to do. When tribes aren't able to receive the support they need, how have some tribes developed their own infrastructure to sustain themselves without the aid of the federal government? 
Earlier, I mentioned that tribes have economic engines in some parts of the country. And that may not be true for all 574 federally recognized, tri recognized tribes, but the fortunate tribes have invested in their governance infrastructure, including enhancing emergency management capability. Uh, again, as I said, in some locations, they have the best equipped and trained response organization and personnel in the area and have no qualms about responding to whoever, whomever needs assistance. Uh, that's not to say that tribes should refuse or be denied federal assistance if they seek to obtain federal government assistance. Uh, that's their option. Uh, states don't go under a means test on whether they have a budget deficit or surplus, and neither should tribes. As Robert discussed, many tribes have developed business enterprises to supplement their budgets. Through those efforts, tribes are less dependent on the federal government for funding programs the tribes deem necessary for their communities. Tribes have self-funded programs for elders, schools, emergency response departments, and community programs. Some tribes have given money to local jurisdictions for their emergency management departments, including fire and EMS, to purchase needed equipment. Those things don't get publicized because that's just the way it is in Indian country. You help your neighbors, but you don't ask to be recognized for it. Can you go over what are the, some of the challenges to tribal emergency management in the past and going forward? In previous episodes, we touched upon some of the challenges tribes face in developing emergency management programs within their communities. Today, let's review some of those and expand our thoughts on some key challenges. While the federal government has recognized tribes as sovereign nations and has a government-to-government -government relationship with the tribes, some of the states and local governments haven't fully recognized tribes as a unit of government within their areas of responsibility. There are impediments within state and local laws that legally prohibit states from including tribes in their grants or in federal disaster declarations. Tribes are then left to their own resources. The answer, in my opinion, is short, and it's adequate funding. The elephant that fills the entire room is the obvious one. It's equitable funding uh, for tribal homeland security emergency management programs and support. Since 2003, Congress has allocated over $50 billion, that's with a B, in Homeland Security grant funds to state and local governments through the Department of Homeland Security, which is managed and administered by FEMA. In contrast, tribal nations have been allocated $60 million, that's with an M, millions versus billions, in federal Homeland Security funding. The funding used is used to implement preparedness initiatives to help strengthen the nation against associated ter potential terrorist attacks and other hazards. The current allocation for the Tribal Homeland Security Grant Program was stagnant for over a decade uh, at $10 million annually. It's up to $15 million this year. For every dollar allocated, the actual need is four times greater. But it's easy to see and understand that most tribes could easily use more than that total allocation per tribe. Many of the tribes with whom we have worked in the past do not have the resources to compete and receive grant funding. This goes to the fact that some of the smaller tribes don't have staff who are trained in the grant application process, nor are there, are there dedicated staff people who are devoted full-time to writing grants. Another concern is that tribes are expected to compete with much larger states and other tribes for the same level of funding. This is sometimes an impossible task and some tribes will not apply for funding because they know they will never be able to compete with the others who are um, based on the requirements of the grants. Another area is the lack of consistency within the, this whole process of emergency management, especially within FEMA. This is an area in which I have had direct experience when I served as the FEMA National Tribal Liaison. Before I address some of the issues, I'd like to explain to our listeners that I am only basing my comments on my own experience at FEMA headquarters, working with my counterparts and colleagues within FEMA. During my tenure, I was responsible for coordinating and directing the tribal program. One of my duties was to provide direction and information to the regional tribal liaisons. What I found was that the regions made program decisions independently of FEMA headquarters and implemented policies as directed by the regional administrator. At the time, this was FEMA policy. This practice continued to myriad of problems and disconnects, not only through the agency, but also throughout Indian country. 
not much of the information tribes were getting was consistent. None of the regions at the time had a dedicated full-time tribal liaison. Rather, those employees were assigned tribal responsibilities as additional duties to their primary job descriptions. That's an important fact that we all need to remember. You can imagine how difficult it is to coordinate 10 regional liaisons and get them all to implement headquarter policies when they are all basically independent. Please understand, there were some tribal liaisons that were very dedicated to providing assistance to the tribes within their regions. However, the reality was that not everyone had the same dedication. During one federal disaster declaration, I called a regional tribal liaison and asked if that individual had contacted the tribes or if the tribal liaison had visited the tribes to uh, determine their damages um, and determine whether or not the tribe needed assistance from FEMA. The response I received really shocked me. The tribal liaison said that they did not leave the regional office and if the tribes needed anything, they should contact the tribal liaison. In my opinion, that tribal liaison lacked motivation, was not doing their job, and was ignoring the trust responsibility an agent of the federal government has to provide assistance to the tribes. Tribes have had to face similar situations and attitudes from the beginning of their engagement with FEMA and other federal agencies. During our last podcast, and again today, I mentioned FEMA's whole of community concept of preparing for and responding responding to incidents. As a concept, it's a pretty good idea, and it could work if FEMA followed their own mandate. For the whole of community concept to work, everyone must be included on an equal basis. As I previously stated, there are, in my opinion, 574 holes, that's H-O-L-E-S, in the whole, W-H-O-L-E, of community concept. These are the 574 federally recognized tribes. Let me give you an example. Less than 100 tribes have received federal disaster assistance funds out of 574. Of the 50 states, if less than 20% of states receive funding, there would be a riot of sorts because states were not receiving federal dollars. Yet, with less than 20% of tribes receiving funding, nothing is said and it isn't an issue in the eyes of the federal government. If that same thing happened in states, the federal government would send people and dollars to the remaining states to provide whatever assistance they needed to teach them what they needed to know and to receive the funding. Tribes should have those same opportunities and they should have tribal liaisons dedicated to providing those services on a consistent basis. Suffice it to say, we're all in this emergency response business together. It doesn't mean we should have to compete for resources, funding, equipment, or other items. Let's face it, there aren't enough of any of those things to go around, and in my mind, it makes sense to go meet your neighbors and ask what you can do to work together. In the end, I think that's really all that anyone is asking, whether it's a tribe, a state emergency management director, or a county emergency management director. Perhaps we should try to make things easier rather than allowing the past and the bureaucracy of all the laws prevent us from the mission, which is the basis for emergency management. And that mission statement is pretty simple, protect lives and property. But it goes both ways. It can not only be the tribe's responsibility to reach across the street to their neighbors. Tribes could be in a better position if FEMA and some components of the department uh, the Homeland Security and other federal agencies had done a better job in meeting the mandates of executive orders and presidential memoranda that have been issued over the past 20 plus years that require consultation and coordination with tribal governments. Executive order one through 175, the consultation and coordination with Indian tribal governments was issued by President Clinton in November 2000. It still is in effect as all presidents since that time have followed up with memoranda that supports the purpose of the original order. The intent of Executive Order 1 through 175 was to establish regular and meaningful consultation and collaboration with tribal officials in the development of federal policies that have tribal implications, to strengthen the U.S. government government relationship with Indian tribes and to reduce the imposition of unfunded mandates upon Indian tribes. With respect to federal statutes and regulations, 
federal government agencies are required to grant Indian tribal governments the maximum administrative discretion possible and to formulate and implement policies where possible to defer to tribes to establish standards. 1 through 175 also states that to the extent practical and permitted by law, no agency shall promulgate any regulation with tribal implications that imposes substantial direct compliance costs on Indian tribal governments not required by statute. Consultation can be viewed um, in a little C and big C perspective. Uh, the little C of consultation is what goes on daily between federal and tribal officials. It can be as common as inquiring if a tribe needs assistance with grant access or providing notice of funding information, just general uh, communication. It gets into the big C category if changes in an agency's tribal policy is altered without tribal consultation. For instance, the original FEMA tribal government Indian policy stated tribes were entitled to have input on the selection of FEMA regional administrators. That's a big deal. Uh, but that part of the policy was admitted a few years ago without notice and consultation. Here one day, gone the next, without any uh, notice to tribes. And some consultation requires protocols of notice, meaning we want to have a uh, consultation with tribal governments. So you inform the tribal leaders, set a date, set a time, and make sure that everyone is aware that this consultation is happening, and then the consultation happens. Uh, that doesn't happen very often these days. Uh, and it's particularly troubling when there's a policy decision like uh, requiring a threat and hazard identification risk assessment as eligibility criteria to apply for tr a tribal homeland security grant. That actually happened. Uh, the thyroid requirement for tribes was forced upon them without notice and consultation. It's not whether it was needed or not. It might be okay. It might not be, but nevertheless, uh, talk with the tribes about it. And there was no any justification for imposing this requirement. On January 26, 2021, um, President Biden issued the Memoranda on Tribal Consultation and Strengthening Nation-to-Nation -nation Relationship. He issued this to the heads of executive departments and agencies. The memo states, the administration is committed to honoring tribal sovereignty and including tribal voices in policy deliberation that affects tribal communities. Uh, the memo is a directive to the head of each agency to submit to the director of the Office of Management and Budget within 90 days of the date of the memorandum. A detailed plan of actions the agency will take to implement the policies and directives of Executive Order 1 through 175. And within 270 days of the date and annually thereafter, the heads of the agency are to submit to the director of OMB a progress report on the status of each action included in the agency's plan, together with any proposed updates to its plan. Uh, time will tell how this pans out, but it certainly is refreshing. And just like COVID-19 vaccine, it could be a tremendous shot in the arm for tribal sovereignty, self-determination, and fulfillment of the trust responsibility in the coming years. Um, given the challenges that we have discussed um, here today, what sources are available to tribes to help them overcome some of these challenges? There are many federal agencies that provide some level of funding for which tribes can apply prior to, during, or even after a disaster declaration. A very short list includes agencies such as the Environmental Protection Agency, the Department of Justice, Bureau of Indian Affairs, Army Corps of Engineers, um, the Department of Health and Human Services, the U.S. Coast Guard, U.S. Customs Border Patrol, and many others. Each has their own criteria for grant application and qualification for funding. In some cases, the Army Corps of Engineers makes equipment, services, supplies, and technical assistance available for mitigation projects, uh, structural uh, projects such as dams, levees, and dikes. There are other federal agencies that provide training, equipment, and exercising dollars, uh, some of which I mentioned. We hope that tribes and other units of government seek other avenues of funding 
and are not becoming solely dependent on FEMA uh, for funding for any emergency management project. Sometimes following disasters, uh, tribes help other tribes in need. There have been a direct tribe-to-tribe contributions. Uh, Indian country is maybe spread out, but it's not that small when it comes to communication about these sorts of things, knowing and hearing that tribe is in a desperate situation. Uh, other tribes have come to their aid. So that's been always positive and and we're all in this together attitude. So it's, it's, it's good to see. There's also uh, one of the emergency management functions regarding voluntary organizations active in disasters. Groups like Salvation Army, American Red Cross, uh, reach out and uh, come to the aid of, of, of tribal governments so tribes have access to these uh, organizations. A few years ago, uh, the National Congress of American Indians and the American Red Cross developed uh, a memorandum of understanding between the organizations regarding what type of assistance and where and when this would be done and and communications between tribal officials and American Red Cross officials to develop this uh, relationship, a relationship. This stemmed from some problem areas, organizations such as American Red Cross and their delivery of services and wanting to help. Things such as uh, shelters. Their native people are reluctant to leave their homes just like any other uh, population. They may not want to do that, but nevertheless, it takes a lot to get them there. And if your shelter is set up and they don't go there, there's, uh, you know, there's thresholds of how many people need to reside in a shelter before it, it, it opens or before it's shut down. There may be things like uh, traditional foods. Native people have survived forever on uh, plants and animals and the, and, and the things that they eat. And sometimes it, it's in spiritual nature. So that helps sustain them. Whether it's a recipe or whether it's the way it's prepared may not uh, be condoned by a volunteer organization in a kitchen or in that setting. And so that could cause some consternation and some disagreement within an organization. But nevertheless, those are the things that could and should be talked about, uh, as well as things such as uh, blood drives. Some tribes are okay with that. Some native people think that's an infringement, that's something that's personal, uh, vested by the creator. And so they're reluctant to take place uh, or or take part in the blood drive. So there are many things that Uh, could and should be discussed, but that's uh, beginning to happen in many instances. But again, as I said, there are many uh, successful and good uh, relationships between organizations such as the Red Cross, Salvation Army, and many of these areas, tribal areas. To wrap up this series, I'd just like to shine a light on the work that you both have done with NCBRT to bring valuable training to tribal communities. Can you tell us a little bit about that? It's about not so much to shine a light on us, but it's shine a light as well as on NCBRT and in, in for inviting us in to be a part of this effort. I, th- I think that they've lied on us to reestablish some of the personal contacts that we've had over the years. Um, as having been at the National Congress of American Indians for 30 plus years, I developed some of these relationships, know some of the tribal officials and leaders, as does Steve. And uh, we've conducted face-to-face meetings. NCBRT has uh, allowed us to do site visits to tribal offices. And that's very helpful uh, to reach an understanding and to work with uh, the tribes on uh, the type of training that they need and want and what uh, NCBRT has to offer. I concur with what Robert said. Um, When NCBRT reached out to us and, and proposed the idea of developing a tribal program, uh, we were both a little bit skeptical because in the past, I guess the saying is we, we've we heard it all before and, and we weren't sure what was really going to happen and, and whether or not NCBRT was uh, committed to doing the, the work that they were asking us to do. Um, so as, as what usually happens in Indian country, 
NCBRT got put to the test, uh, Robert and I gave them a little bit of a challenge and and asked for a commitment, and and they granted that commitment and have stood behind it since then. Um, one of the things that we talked about when when Robert and I were deciding uh, how we wanted to go about developing this program is is that when we contacted the tribal leaders and people in emergency management that we had known and worked with over the years, we asked what was important to them. We, we wanted to know what their needs were. We wanted to know uh, the issues, uh, the current things uh, that were either happening or not happening in their world. And we listened to them and we defined those needs that, that were important based on the tribal input that we received, along with some of our past experience. And we offered that back to NCBRT to, to help uh, get this whole program off the ground. It's good to continue these relationships and not only come out and train, but the follow-up. You know, what more can we do? What are, what are your needs? It's not a one-and-done um, uh, it's it's not a one and done offer. Uh, we want to stay in touch. We want to follow up. We want to, you know, these courses are revised periodically. Uh, every department needs to train and perhaps retrain or be updated with the latest techniques, which NCBRT has to offer. And so this is a, uh, a ongoing relationship. And it's, I, I think it's been the, a great example of what can be done um, with with some uh, support by the right people, the management, um, uh, Jeff Main, Devon Cooper, Chris Meister, Jerry Monnier, and, and and others. It, it, they've just been wonderful uh, for their support and direction. One of the things that we were able to do, and one of the unexpected um, benefits of of being tribal liaisons and working with. NCBRT is that we were given the opportunity to meet with instructors prior to uh, a class being uh, delivered in Indian country. Um, we, were, we were able to talk to them about their own experience, their background knowledge uh, about Indian country, about tribes, how tribal governments worked, um, where they were, who their audience was going to be when they were delivering these courses. And I think to to an individual, every, every instructor with whom we met was open to listening to what we had to say. Sometimes we weren't really sure that the things that we were we were talking about with the instructors was getting through to them. But then we noticed that as the classes were were being conducted, uh, and sometimes throughout an entire week. The instructors would come up to us during breaks, after class, uh, during dinner, and and before classes uh, started the next day, and would ask us questions and became fully engaged. and And what we really discovered was that they were in fact um, open to the the discussions that we were having. And it it goes to the thing that Robert and I both say just about every time we introduce ourselves before a tribal class. You know, we're working with a world class organization and and world-class instructors. Uh, that wouldn't be possible if, if NCBRT was not dedicated, not just to providing quality training to Indian country, but to providing quality training uh, to uh, non-native communities or in, in law enforcement, uh, emergency management services all across the country and around the world. So we're, we're very pleased and honored to be part of that process. We want to thank everyone at NCBRT uh, and the team of technical support that we receive on a regular basis. It's just wonderful to know that they're uh, fully supportive of what we do and how we do it. And this relationship is what makes this program so successful. Before we close out, I just want to mention uh, that in the first session, we talked about the Bureau of Indian Affairs and how it was basically set up, develop, and maintain uh, paternalistic policies and thwart tribal sovereignties, sovereignty as well as to uh, attempt to assimilate Native peoples into mainstream America. Uh, there's been a significant improvement in the BIA regarding its managerial capability and the ability to carry out its trust responsibility in land, resources and management, and delivery of services. However, there's been a minimum effort, in my opinion, to implement and manage emergency programs within the BIA. 
Uh, there may be the possibility for policy changes on the horizon if the tribes are allowed to work with the BIA in the near future. And in this regard of how it does or does not do emergency management. On March 16th, Deb Holland, a citizen of the Pueblo of Laguna, was confirmed as the first Native American Secretary of the Department of Interior, which oversees the BIA as a component agency of the Department of Interior. When Secretary Designate Holland was nominated, she recounted that Alexander H. H. Stewart, the department's third secretary, said the only alternative for the United States after defeating the Indians in the wars was to civilize or exterminate them. Well, we're still here. Stay tuned, folks. This completes a four-part series of podcasts about tribal emergency management in Indian country. Uh, Steve Glubick and myself, Robert Holden, want to thank everyone at NCBRT uh, for their support, direction, and assistance in this production. Uh, the instructors um, have been integral to this. We've learned a lot from them, and hopefully they've learned something from us regarding uh, public service. And as they continue to selfishly share their knowledge and expertise to train law enforcement and other public safety responders in the communities, trying to keep their communities and families in the country safer. Thank you to all. May the Creator continue to watch over us as we walk together on a good path into the future. If you have any questions or topic suggestions for future episodes, please send us an email at podcast at ncbrt.lsu.edu. Make sure you subscribe to the LSU NCBRT Preparedness Podcast wherever you listen to podcasts, and we'll see you again next time.